Welcome. We are very glad that you are here. Um, we're really uh, very pleased to see such a wonderful response. Uh, and again, my appreciation to our friends uh, along the walls. Uh, thank you. I think you'll find it well worth your effort uh, to be here. I'm going to make my uh, introduction uh, brief, not because our guest is not worthy of a long introduction, uh, but because he's worthy of the time that I would be absorbing uh, by telling you about him. And I know that you'd much rather hear from him, and so I will uh, keep my remarks very brief. <laughs> Let me begin with a, th a thought. Nobel laureate uh, Elie Wiesel said that to forget a Holocaust is to kill twice. I'll repeat that. To forget a Holocaust is to kill twice. And so tonight we have come uh, to remember. What does it mean to remember the Holocaust? Is it simply to remind ourselves that six million uh, innocent, uh, six million innocent Jews, along with uh, hundreds of thousands of, of others, uh, were uh, systematically uh, killed? Does it mean to reflect on the political and social machinations that brought about uh, the circumstances that produced a Hitler and a Nazi Germany? Does it mean to feel outrage uh, at those who perpetrated this horror and those who stood by? Perhaps yes to all of those questions, but I think most of all it means to tell the story. To hear again of the courage of those who died and the horror of those uh, who were responsible. And to celebrate that courage and to be warned uh, that what happened once in history uh, is not lost to history itself, but in fact uh, can be repeated. And so we come to hear the stories again, to honor those who have died and to challenge those of us who live with the stories that you will hear tonight. We're very pleased and delighted to have Dr. Walter Ziffer uh, with us and his wife, Gail, who is back here on the edge. Uh, Dr. Ziffer is a so Holocaust survivor uh, from Czechoslovakia, his native home. He is currently an adjunct professor at Mars Hill uh, College. He has degrees from Vanderbilt University in Engineering and then several theological uh, degrees from prominent theological seminaries, both in the United States and uh, also in France. He is a popular speaker and a prolific author. Uh, well, we'll see if you're a, pro a popular speaker. As he shakes his head as I introduce him. Uh, I think you'll find him a popular speaker and one who you will profit from. So I'm going to let those remarks uh, be my introduction. And to say to you, Dr. Ziffer, that we are glad that you're here. He's been on campus for about a day, and uh, I've already had the pleasure of getting to become his friend. And I'm very honored and delighted to be that. And now we want you to come and be our friend. Come, please. Thank you, my friend, Dr. McMahon. It's nice to make friends. Uh, well, the first thing I do want to say is I'd like to welcome you, of course, and uh, also tell you that the sequel to this talk takes place tomorrow morning, right? Where? In the chapel. In the chapel. Okay. I've never been to Mercer before. It's a new experience for me. Can you hear me okay? Can you make out my English? <laughs> yeah, that's good news. Um, <laughs> So thank you for the invitation. I do want to say a word about how it happened that I am here. Uh, it so happened that um, I taught at Marshall College in the Department of Religion and Philosophy for a good many years. And um, then I resigned. I'm 86 years old, you know. So my beard should be about that long, <laughs> uh, but I keep it trimmed. And um, so I was out for about two and a half years. Uh, and then um, my successor resigned, and the college asked me to come back to fill in the vacancy. So I said, okay, I love the school, as all your professors love Mercer, of course. I love Marshall College, and so I returned. 
And lo and behold, next to my office, there is the office of a young, good-looking young man uh, who happens to be Dr. McMahon's son, also a Dr. McMahon. And we became friends. And um, I don't know how it happened from then on. Suddenly, I got to be invited to Mercer. Can you figure that out? <laughs> uh, so uh, here I am. And let me also say that Dr. McMahon's son is just a lovely t person and a very, very good teacher from what I hear from my students who happen to take <laughs> courses from him as well. So I'm very grateful to have been invited and to be here and to see this place filled with people. Uh, I was told I might expect between 50, maybe 100. Well, I think there are a good many more than 100 here. So that's good. The chances, you know, of me uh, being here, actually, and speaking to you uh, were very, very slim in view of the fact that most friends of mine and two-thirds of my family uh, in my homeland of Czechoslovakia did not make it. They didn't make it. Guess why? Because they were murdered. Uh, they were murdered by the Nazis after the Nazi Germany invaded us uh, on September 1st, 1939. Uh, they were murdered because Europe uh, between 1933 and 1945 was a hellish place, a Europe that had gone literally mad. And um, so many Europeans, which is hard to understand, succumbed to this totally crazy ideology that Hitler offered, a murderous ideology, uh, who uh, on this maniacal basis of a previous theology called anti-Semitism, the hatred of everything that is Jewish and live Jewishly, uh, started murdering the Jews. He wanted to get rid of anti-Semitism actually by murdering the objects of anti-Semitism. That way, no Jews would be left. And had Hitler won the war, I certainly wouldn't be standing here because Hitler worldwide would have done the same thing, would have eliminated the Jewish people. So he almost succeeded in the enterprise, I must say, sadly. And six million Jews were killed, as you heard from Dr. McMahon. Um, it's, it's, to me, and to a lot of other people, a mystery how people would succumb to that kind of a craziness. But let me tell you, and this is a warning to you, that if a crazy thing like Hitler's ideology, a hatred of a certain people, is taught long enough, it will stick. And it will descend into your souls and into your minds. And uh, you eventually have the possibility and and it happens that you jump on that bandwagon with this crazy leader and uh, lead the, the world uh, toward destruction. So six million Jews died, to be sure, but not all Jews, thanks to the victory of the Allies, uh, Americans, British, and uh, the Soviet Army at that particular time. And uh, some of us did survive. And those of us who did survive this little hell through which we were forced to go um, feel constrained to repeat that story, to tell that story. It needs not, it, it must not be forgotten. Um, this, is, this is history that took place. Do not believe those people who tell you that the Holocaust never happened. This is another crazy ideology. Don't give in to them. You'll have heard a survivor. So you can now tell them, hello, you know, I, I heard one. And he seemed pretty normal, you know. <laughs> and he seemed to know what he's talking about. And he told us his stories. So we were spared for a while in, uh, where, in the place where I lived. You see, in Germany, the problem began as Hitler ascended to the uh, chancellorship of Germany in 1933. Uh, we were spared in Czechoslovakia and in Poland and in num a number of other places for a while. But then 
On September 1st, 1939, World War II broke out and we were invaded. And from that point on, we were under the Nazis uh, and our miserable life began. Now, it is virtually impossible, and you will certainly agree with me on that, to uh, tell you about five horrible years, three of which, more than three of which, were lived in concentration camps because I passed through seven concentration camps. Uh, not voluntarily so, but I was sent there, obviously. And time and calendar stood still. So I cannot even tell you how long I stayed, stayed in this or that camp. There's no way for me to determine it at this point. And therefore, it's also impossible for me to give you a sort of a rundown on my whole life during those terrible years in roughly 45 or 50 minutes. We will have a question and answer period afterwards, and you'll have a chance to ask your questions that seem uh, important um, to you. Now, Gail, my wife, uh, my wonderful wife, uh, recently visited several Holocaust-related uh, exhibits in Asheville. Um, the school where I teach is just north of Asheville. The major city is Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and one of the exhibits uh, is called the Kennesaw exhibit, which originated at Kennesaw University, which is, I think, close to Atlanta. Um, and um, it um, deals with young people who were caught in this hellish time under Hitler, and who then, of course, survived, as I did, and who are sort of telling the story, as it were, uh, something that I'm going to do tonight. Now, my person and my life and, and the life of a number of other survivors are not represented in the Kennesaw exhibit, which is a photographic exhibit. Um, uh, we, yes, we were caught in the same catastro catastrophe, but um, um, we, we, survive, we survived, as I said, and obviously the Kennesaw exhibit does not cover every survivor uh, that uh, is still around. So some of us, have written memoirs, and some of these memoirs have been published. I wrote a 400-page memoir, which uh, uh, I did, did not plan to publish, but I wrote it primarily for my children and grandchildren, and I happen to have two great-grandchildren, um, and they need to know about the, the daddy's, granddaddy's, great-granddaddy's history, of course. Uh, this needs to be passed on, and I hope what you hear what you hear tonight also will be passed on in a certain way to, to your friends and acquaintances. This needs to be known. Now, <clears throat> most of us survivors would like to forget what we actually went through and that robbed us of our youth and of our innocence. Uh, but how can one forget? It's impossible to forget. Uh, we, uh, in the Jewish tradition, uh, are happy to have had a wonderful sage in the 17th century whose name was the Baal Shem Tov, which means the master of the good name. And his famous, one of his famous sayings is that remembrance is the key to redemption. You may want to discuss that in your classes here at Mercer to see what, what this means. I will not go into the details, but you may get from my talk a bit of an answer, a bit of an explanation of the saying. So as time goes by, uh, the, um, the pain does dull a bit. There's no question about that. Uh, but you know, and I'm speaking for myself now, for no one else, the sadness of it of what happened, and um, the anger about what happened has um, probably increased over the years that I've been around. And so daily, literally daily, uh, and uh, more often during the night, these terrible times return to me. Uh, they come back, and uh, those remembrances that come back are toxic, they're poisonous, because what we lived through was poison. And that poison 
uh, which we lived left a deposit in our souls, hearts, minds, and every so often works itself to the surface uh, when the proper triggers are uh, pulled. I'm not talking about pistol triggers. I'm talking about things that you live that trigger remembrances. And that happens to me, of course. And so what I want to do here tonight is to tell you how these poisonous deposits within me trigger my mind as I see and experience certain things in my life today, in my daily life today. Uh, so all of us survivors have a catalog of these poisonous texts and of these poisonous pictures that are up here that return every so often and I would like to share this, that with you. Uh, it's up to date, you see, very much up to date. So let me begin with a totally up to date example of what happened to me very, very recently. Uh, my wife and I uh, in the evening usually watch television and um, in the process of watching television about uh, two, three weeks ago, I can't give you the exact date, we uh, saw the newly elected Pope in Rome coming out on the balcony, you know, to give his blessing uh, to the people. And from, from, uh, from what I've heard, what I've read, uh, Pope Francis seems to be a good person, a modest person. Uh, he lives in a modest room. I recently saw him wash the feet of some poor people in Rome. Um, and there were thousands and thousands of people in St. Peter's Square in Rome a beautiful place, by the way. And they were acclaiming him. And there was joy in these people's faces. Uh, who, who, who has seen Pope Francis? And uh, could, could you just tell me? Uh, raise your hand. Uh, some of you guys should be watching television. The good stuff. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that's, uh, that's good education, you know. So anyway, what, what bothered me is, as I watched uh, the, the, these people in St. Peter's Square, was their sort of delirious, frenzy like uh, a, a sort of a hysteria they were in. You know, some were weeping, some were shouting, some were waving their hands, uh, arms, etc. And I, let me tell you, am afraid of frenzied people. I'm afraid of people who go into these hysterias. So here is how the toxin went to work when I saw Pope Francis, a good, a good guy, supposedly. So I remembered how thousands and thousands of people came to our square in my hometown before we were deported to the concentration camps, when we were still in town, evicted from one place to the next. That particular place, windows, gave on this big square in our town where these thousands of people assembled. When the German propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, came to town to give a speech. And as we watched, we saw uh, a frenzied mass of people. They were acclaiming him. And they were shouting, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler. And they were laughing, and smiling. They were in a kind of hysteria, you see, also. When the meeting came to an end, the people from the square emptied through a street uh, on whose side our particular house stood, our apartment, and my sister and my cousin and I were at the window to look out. When the people saw us, they kept, picked up stones in the street, threw them at the windows, smashed our windows. You filthy Jews, that's what they shouted. I'm afraid of people who go into hysteria acclaiming a person and that person's ideology. But there's something else that came to my mind because of that to toxic deposit that, that is there. Uh, Francis is the Pope. And this happened at the Vatican, of course. Well, I immediately remembered that it was, in fact, the Vatican, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, and the Pope that instituted the Inquisition back in the early Middle Ages. But during the Inquisition, 
40,000 Jewish people, men, women, and children, were burned alive at the stake. That's what came to mind. Not a pretty picture. I remember the Crusades when a pope, Urban II in 1096, I think, 1095, started the Crusades, preached the Crusades. And it was the Crusaders who, on the way to the Holy Land, slaughtered tens of thousands of people. And once in the Holy Land, slaughtered some more people in the name of the Christian faith. That's what toxin in your mind bring about. And then I thought of Cortez and of Pizarro, Mexico, the conqueror of Mexico, and of Peru, who again, in the name of faith, mission, went to Latin America. When that episode was over, one million Latin Americans were dead. That's what the toxin does for me. And you see, uh, as far as I know, Pope Francis is an honorable man. He's a good person. And yet it is these memories that he evoked in me. That's not good. There's another defining moment in life that I want to, sh to share with you. Uh, when I was nine years old, I walked home with a friend of mine from school, and the, the, the railroad tracks that run through our town in Czechoslovakia, which is now the Czech Republic, by the way. And we had to go through an underpass to cross, to cross under these railroad tracks. And as we were down in the dark, suddenly the rocks and stones were, fl were flying at us, and we heard the kids shout, Jid, Jid, Jidek. Jid in all Slavic languages means Jew. Jidek, little stinky Jews. And my friend and I started running, he in one direction, me in another direction, and we saved ourselves. But had we been caught, and this has hap this happened before, so I'm talking again from a standpoint of history, had we been caught, the kids would have pulled down our pants and look down at our circumcision. And they would have laughed and beaten us up and left us lying there. That's another toxic moment in my life, which uh, sort of, when I think about it, makes me sick. Because it reminds me of all the anti-Semitic outbreaks in Europe, which were common for about 19 centuries, believe it or not. And uh, little kids like myself were caught in this. Just imagine what that would do to you had you been caught in this kind of a situation as an eight or nine year old boy. Well, uh, the first night, and they we're talking about September 1st to September 2nd, uh, I was a little boy, okay, 12 years old, and I couldn't I couldn't uh, sleep very well. Around six o'clock in the morning, five, six o'clock, I, I was up, I was turning around my bed. I, something scared me. And so I went in search of my father. Uh, my father and I had a fantastic, wonderful relationship. Uh, I've never admired any human being as much as I had admired my father. A very, very good person, too. And my mom, a What's in Yiddish is called a Yiddish mame, which means a Jewish mom. That says it all, you know. Uh, no, no, seriously. Uh, wonderful cook, you know, caring from one end to the other, from birth to death for the children. Okay, so I, I wake up, I'm scared, and I go in search of my father. And I find my father on a back balcony of our apartment. We had a big balcony, and my father was an attorney, successful attorney. And I find him there finally, not lying next to my mother in bed, but on that balcony. And I walk out uh, onto the balcony and uh, see my father standing there, pale, white as a, as a, as a bed sheet, you know, or as a ceiling. And uh, he motions me over and I walk over to him and I said to him, Daddy, uh, what's going on? Why are you here? 
And I hear this funny sound. I hear the sound of breaking glass, of smashing of things, of things crashing down to the ground, of laughter, of singing. Couldn't figure out what that's all about. And I asked my dad, you know, what's going on, Daddy? And um, he puts his hands on my head as I stand in front of him. Usually very warm hands, but that night, very cold hands. I noticed that. And uh, he says, Valti, they called me Valti, my name is Walter. Uh, I think they are destroying our synagogue. Everybody know what a synagogue is? Yeah, okay. There's a stinking sort of smell in the air, the ashes, and um, the sun is just then coming up behind the roofs of the neighboring homes. And I said, Daddy, look, the sun's coming up. And my father says to me, yes, uh, Walty, the sun is coming up, but I think our sun is setting, he said. I'll never forget that. And ashes come down and settle in my hair. And the next morning, we go out to see what happened. And my father's prediction was, my father's guess, I should say, was absolutely correct because our synagogue was in ruins. Uh, walls standing, the, in, the inside smoking, uh, still fire, small fires in there. The, 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 the cupboard where the holy scrolls are kept, the, the Pentateuch, uh, torn, lying on the ground. These are always ornamented with silver ornaments. The silver ornaments gone, of course, stolen. And we stand there, and there are other people standing next to us. And my father, who was a very prestigious attorney in town, whom people greeted uh, as we took our Sunday morning walk, usually, he, my sister, and I, uh, these people who took the hat of, good morning, Dr. Ziffer, et cetera, et cetera, these very same people do not know us. No one says hello, and there's snickering going on laughing, I hear one person say, well, good, it finally happened to them. Things of that sort. Now that, you see, is a defining moment in a child's life. And I couldn't understand why these people suddenly didn't know my father anymore. We had become total strangers and looked down upon, of course. So these are toxins that collect in your subconscious and every so often surface and um, do the damage. Um, in our dining room in, uh, uh, in Weaverville, that's a little town north of Asheville, there hangs a picture of uh, my family, of uh, the two-thirds of, of two-thirds of my family, roughly, of whom two-thirds have been murdered. So there are my cousins there, for instance. There's my cousin, a picture of my cousin Hannah, uh, who wanted to be a medical doctor like her father. There's a picture of Lydia, my cousin with whom I played every Sunday afternoon, who wanted to become a women's apparel designer, who was very, very talented, a very beautiful girl, by the way, whose brother survived and who is in Israel today. Um, there is the, a picture of my cousin Ilze, uh, blue eyes, blonde, uh, whom I loved as much as I loved my sister, who committed suicide many years after the Holocaust. She survived, but I will not go into details, in a situation that co connected to the Holocaust, um, committed suicide, jumped off the bridge in Cologne in Germany and killed herself. Uh, so I rem remember all these faces all the time. Every time I'm in the dining room, I look at the picture and I can't, um, get rid of these, of these thoughts, all two-thirds of them murdered. And in the case of Hannah in particular, uh, the, the, tra the, the tragedy is so incredible. They actually left before the Germans invaded our town. They went to a Polish city by the name of Lwów. And uh, <laughs> at one point, the Gestapo closed the street on which they happened to walk, and they asked for identity papers. And my uncle, her father, had both Jewish identity papers as well as Aryan, you know, non-Jewish, Gentile 
papers which he had bought. When the Gestapo came to him and asked him for identity papers, he mistakenly pulled out the Jewish papers, had just enough time to give his wife, Gerda, and his daughter, Hannah, a cyanide pill, which they swallowed. He was shot point blank, point blank in the face, and they were dead within seconds. So these things come up, whether you like it or not. You know, this is a toxin that deposits in your soul, and um, the triggers bring them up. Um, g g let me give you another one. I have two or three more. Uh, after being evicted four times in my hometown to an ever smaller place, losing everything my, f my parents had ever collected during their lifetime, we ended up in a ghetto on the periphery of our town. Uh, roughly 1,000 people, 1,000 Jewish people. And uh, it was during that time also that my father, who was the head of the Jewish community before the war as well as during the war, made it possible for some of us young people to work in a bolt and nut factory to which we had to take a train. We worked the night shift there, and there were about 50 kids that worked there. Working in a factory, in an industry that was related to the German war effort, delayed deportation, okay? So that was a good thing. And I always wanted to become a mechanical engineer, so I sort of enjoyed working there anyway. The situation was not too bad. What had happened during that time in the ghetto that I, f I fell in love with a little girl my age. Her name was Lydia, beautiful girl. Green eyes, golden blonde hair, and just a, a wonderful specimen of humanity, and she loved me too. Well, you may smile, hey, 12 years old, 13 years old, that's puppy love, you know. Well, it's real love, it's real love. Uh, when we went down to the train station and sat in the, tr in the wagon, in the car, you know, to go to that factory, we held hands and we sat cheek to cheek and my cheeks were burning up. Um, love is real when, when, it's, when it's real, okay? <laughs> well, one evening, we were housed in a ghetto which was an abandoned uh, amusement park, you might say. And there were big dance halls there. There's dance halls about that size, only farther back, long, bigger than this. And the people strung wires from one end to the other and hung sheets, white sheets, bed sheets on it to, to make cubicles out of this hall. And uh, oh, they were like 10 by 10 or 12 by 12 or something like that. And my family with other two other families stayed on the, on, on, on the stage of that hall. Well, one evening Lydia came and tearfully told me, my parents decided to get out of that ghetto. We're going to try to leave during the night, sneak out, and we'll walk toward the Soviet Union, which was still a haven for Jews in those days. We wept, we embraced, we kissed, and she gave me her pendant from her gold chain. And she said, Walter, whenever you look at this gold pendant, which was a little disc that turned in a yoke, and when you turned it, when you flipped it, it spelled out, I love you in English. I have a replica on my, on my keychain here. You can see it afterwards if you want to. Uh, anyway, she said, we're leaving. So I was, of course, very, very sad. She was very sad. They left. About 10 days later, my father was informed that her parents and she were found shot dead. 50 miles east of our town, a German patrol had caught up with them, intercepted them, and shot them on the spot. I don't know how much Im imagination it takes on your part to realize what this does to a little boy who loved that little girl. I was demolished. I was undone. Well, that's toxin that deposits itself in one's soul. How can I forget that? I can't. Uh, let me shorten this a little bit. We were deported. I was sent through seven different slave labor and concentration camps. Uh, I remember arriving in the second camp 
where the first thing they did to us was take us to the wash barracks. Uh, prisoners who already had been there shaved our heads, didn't shave, clipped our, the hair on our head, and then shaved an inch wide strip from here, running down back. In case one could possibly flee, uh, one would be immediately found to be a concentration camp inmate, and the police would identify you as such and take you back or to some place worse. Um, so that happened there. But one of the worst things to me, and I'm sure to, to everybody else who went through that experience, was that once we came out of the shower, there was a bundle of clothes waiting for you, for each person, and these were the blue, white, striped pajamas that you've seen on television programs, I'm sure, that we had to wear. And on front jacket, there was a number. My number happened to be 64,757, and on the back of my jacket, there was the same number sewn on. And so from that moment on, Walter Ziffer was no longer Walter Ziffer, a human being with a name, with the dignity of his own as a human being, but reduced to a number. And that number followed me through the successive camps. Now what happens when you become a, a number? What happens is that you have become an object that is numbered. What can you do with an object? Well, you can do anything you want to with an object. You can throw it into a trash can. You can step on it, you can kill it, and that's exactly what happened. It's easier to kill, to murder an object than a human being. And this is what we all Jewish people there were actually transformed into, objects that others manipulated in any, any way they wanted to manipulate us. And that, of course, spelled out for most of us, murder. As I said at the beginning, no clocks, no radios, no watches, no calendars. We went through a, for lack of a better expression, through a separate cosmos, through a, diff through a separate world system, which was no longer a humanly oriented system, but a subhumanly oriented system. And uh, we were the objects. 64,757. Uh, I have two grandsons and eight granddaughters. And one of my grandsons sent me an email once uh, about three, four years ago, maybe more, I'm not sure, five years ago. Asked me, granddaddy, he said, would you mind if I had your concentration camp number tattooed on my arm? I was stunned. I didn't know what to say. I finally said to him, look, uh, Dan, <laughs> it's your body. <laughs> you know, you're in control. You can do whatever you wish. And I uh, later on asked him, why do you want to do this? And he said, well, I would like to have this history somehow perpetuated on my body, he said. I still don't quite understand it. In fact, I have a problem understanding the tattooing process altogether, but <laughs> most people, so many people have it done nowadays. That's another story. But um, why, why do this? Well, he, he wanted it. So uh, let me give you a couple of more um, examples. I was in a camp by the name of Schmiedeberg. This, this was a camp in which the Germans had a factory built into a mountain in which uh, V2s were produced and tested. And the V2s were uh, missiles that were sent over England. They were unmanned uh, rockets, you might say, not guided rockets, but they rained down on England and they caused a lot of damage, of course. You may have seen on television how London burned. It burned from those V2 rockets that were dropped on England. So uh, I worked in that uh, factory on the outside uh, with, an, with the rest of the prisoners in that particular camp. And what my job was, was bending rebars into certain shapes 
that went into the concrete, into the liquid concrete, which eventually hardened. And by having the rebars in it that were connected with each other, wired together, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, this became steel reinforced concrete. Very, very hard stuff to demolish, of course. So anyway, uh, prior to my getting this job, a young fellow, a Jewish fellow, was killed on that machine, which smashed his thigh. And he died on the spot there and was taken, <coughs> taken away. When the job was given to me, I felt very privileged because it was a machine that was doing the work and not I. And you know, my strength was ebbing away and uh, I couldn't do much physically anymore. But that was just pushing a pedal to the left and to the right with one of my legs, with one of my feet. And so it was a sort of promotion, you might say. Well, anyway, one day, the, uh, the head of the, the, the German uh, uh, work group there came to me and said, motioned me come to come to go with him to his office. I went with him to his office, and uh, he spread out a blueprint before me and said, well, from here on, you're going to bend these iron bars in this particular way, a new way. I added up the dimensions that showed, you know, this portion and then up here, this portion, and this, and then a total dimension, and the things didn't add up. And so I told the man, listen, there's a problem here. The, the, the dimensions don't add up. Uh, he looked at me, shook his head in unbelief, and he said, you're not a Jew. I said, I'm not a Jew. I'm here because I am a Jew. He said, no, that's impossible. I said, well, why is that impossible, sir? He said, because Jews are not capable of learning the German language. All right, now I was amazed. And I said to him, pardon me, sir, but my native language is German, which it was. And he kept on shaking his head, walked over to his cupboard, pulled out his lunchbox, opened it up, and gave me a sandwich that his wife had prepared for him. It was at that camp that I realized what education can do to you, what wrong education can do to you. He had been indoctrinated with facts such as the Jews are incapable of learning a language other than Yiddish, which was the Polish Jewish, lang Jewish language. But there were plenty of people there who spoke German too and who spoke Polish. But Jews are subhuman beings, you see. And as long as that is taught year after year, year after year to ears that listen, people start believing it. And so that particular person started believing it. To me, this opened my eyes and my mind to the importance of education. And this is why I think I became an educator. Because wrong education leads to catastrophes. And that we want to avoid. And you, most of you young people here, keep that in mind. What you are learning here is, I hope, all good education. I'm pretty sure about it. I sat in one of your classes this morning, was very impressed with it. But keep that in mind. Because someday you may be exposed to lies. And those lies need to be rejected early enough before they take a hold of you and you start believing them. Another defining moment in my life, it rained in that same camp for days and for days. It was fall. And then came the snow. And then the snow melted. And there were puddles all over the place, huge puddles. Now, we had wooden shoes with cloth tops. And by the time we worked, we, walk, we walked to work to the construction site. We walked back. Uh, we were soaked. Our feet were soaked. And th this resulted in cold feet, of course. And every time I climbed into my, onto my platform, a wooden platform covered with uh, straw, I never during the night could get any warm feet. 
to this day, I have a problem with cold feet. When I have cold feet, I'm cold all over. Well, there was the head of the German group, the work group, who walked around in his leather coat, and he had rubber boots. And he just walked through these puddles with Elan. You know, the water was splashing to the right and to the left. He had rubber boots. For night after night after night, I dreamed of rubber boots. Couldn't get it out of my head. That was the greatest wish I ever had in my life, to have rubber boots. And then I came to America in 1948, and I was able to buy my first rubber boots. And I felt like buying a bottle of champagne and getting drunk for happiness, <laughs> because I now had rubber boots. These are defining moments in one's life, believe it or not. Absolutely. Um, I'm not sure whether you can appreciate this. I don't know whether you can appreciate having a full refrigerator with food. And that brings me uh, to food, because food was the thing we dreamed about day and night, awake and asleep, food. We called it organizing food. That was a sort of a uh, camp jargon that we used. And so my wife here in America, over a period of time that we were married, uh, was pretty unhappy because I wanted to buy food. You know, she had a list for three items, went to the grocery store, was walked out with two sacks full of food. Where do you put the food? Went to the fridge. We had a regular fridge. It filled up. How do you get the food from the second and third shelf down below? You know, how do you get it out without taking all the stuff in front out and then guessing what's in back and trying to get that? Well, food, food, food. Uh, Backbreaking labor, beatings, degradation, infestation with lice. And let me tell you, that was something else, the, the lice, uh, bed bugs, uh, and sometimes loss of that little food that one had because thievery that was going on in the camps when people stole things out of the pockets. I mean, you, you didn't really much undress. You stayed in the same clothing you worked in. They were filthy, but you kept your bread in. And you know, the conversations in camp dealt with food all the time. That was the main, the, the, the main subject. Uh, and the people remembered the bar mitzvahs and the bat mitzvahs and the birthdays and, and the cakes. And they invented a lot of it too. Some of it, I'm sure, was their invention. Uh, food, food, food. Well, how can you blame me for having, wanting to get a lot of food? I don't blame myself. So you can see how the Holocaust has marked us. Uh, it has marked all survivors. And we are sort of condemned to relive these moments over and over again. But there's one item that marked me more than anything else, as I think now about all this in retrospect. The deepest uh, thing that marked my psyche, that lay down there hidden for quite a while, but surpassed particularly after I studied biblical studies and theology, that was a question that is asked by many, many survivors to this day. Have you ever heard of the concentration camp of Auschwitz? I see heads nodding. The question is, where was God at Auschwitz? That is the overwhelming question that has hung over all, every survivor's head, I think, without exception. Well, I have asked that question with groups like you. And there were always people who have said to me, well, that's the wrong ask question to ask. Where was God at Auschwitz? The right question to ask is, where, is, where was humanity at Auschwitz? Well, that question has a lot of merit. There's no question about that. That is a very good question. But in no way does it obviate, does it make unnecessary, does it make meaningless the question, where was God at Auschwitz? That is a germane question. 
that has to be answered. Uh, and so that issue is very, very serious to me. And I think it should be all of us, whether we're Jews or whether we're Christians or whoever we are, just plain humans. Where was God at Auschwitz? You know, books have been written, of course, about all this. And um, the problem, the whole issue of the Holocaust is usually divided among three groups, the victims, whether dead or alive, the victims, and then there are the perpetrators, well, the Nazis themselves, and then there are also, then there's also a third category of people, and that is the bystanders. I'm thinking of what I told you earlier about the burning of our synagogue, when these people stood there looking at the burned down synagogue. They were bystanders. I have no idea who burned the synagogue. Maybe some vandals, maybe Germans, I don't know. But there were bystanders who just saw it all happen and didn't, didn't raise their little finger to do anything about this. Bystanders. So there's a text. Now I'm a, I'm a Bible scholar in the book of Leviticus. And it reads in Hebrew, Lo ta'amod al dam reacha, which means do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. That's what it means. You get the idea? Something happens to your neighbor, don't just stand there and look on, but do something about it. Take the situation into your hands, even though this may be a very risky thing to do. So the question that we survivors have is, has God the Almighty and the all-benevolent been a bystander during the Holocaust? Now that is a very, very important question. If this, what I read in the book of Leviticus, lo tamod al damrecha, do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor, if that is a commandment to us humans, then should not, a fortiori, the author of the commandment live and act by that same commandment? These are heavy questions. You may not like them. I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but you are intelligent people. You need to ask yourselves that question. So I personally do not like to believe in a bystander God. I don't. And uh, the, this is an enigma, the enigma of God's absence and God's non-intervention, not only in the Holocaust, but also in many other catastrophes that have hit us humans in our own time. Uh, that raises the same question, where is God in all this? Tsunamis, earthquakes. I mean, I've lived during the last 10 years through three such catastrophes that have killed about one million human beings. So you can ask yourself there too, where was God during those catastrophes? It's a perfectly leg legitimate question. I'm not going to answer you that question tonight. Uh, this is, pardon the expression, a cliffhanger. Because I'm going to speak to that question tomorrow morning. And so I'd like for you to come, of course, if you're interested in that question. And you'll get my limited answer, the best I have been able to figure out so far. So what I would like to leave with you tonight is, and that, that is a fact, uh, it seems that when hatred is taught, is preached long enough, it does sink into most people's mind, psyche, soul. And that in turn then leads to not just hatred, thought hatred, but hatred enacted, hatred done. And that was done precisely between 1933 and 1945 in Germany. Uh, physical violence and mass murder. So how could the Holocaust have happened? Well, precisely that way, as I just explained. That's how it happened. So we must never let it happen again. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm talking. That's why I'm telling you what I'm telling you. And I'd like to end this talk uh, by quoting a real prophetic sentence from the Bible. 
it's, it's uh, not very often heard, that sentence, it's from the book of Proverbs, which is not the most studied book in Christian or in Jewish circles. And it reads like this. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Rescue those who are taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not requite man according to his work? That is pretty much the end of my talk. But I want to add one more thing on a lighter side. In the Jewish tradition, when we read Torah, when we read from scripture, we are told to usually end on a positive note. And if you check this out, you'll find that it's very true. And so I want to leave this talk that I've just given you on a more positive note. You remember what I told you about the fridge? My wife being unhappy with me buying all this stuff in the store and stuffing the fridge, the fridge with all this stuff. I love eating. <laughs> if you think my, my coat is too big, that's because I'm on a diet. <laughs> and I, I bought this coat a few weeks ago, and it was fairly well filled. Uh, so it, I, I hope I'll get thinner and thinner. But the fridge problem has been sold, solved. That's a positive note. You know how? We went to Sears, and what a bigger fridge. <laughs> <laughs> 10 cubic feet bigger, it's now 31 cubic feet, and my wife is happy, and I am happy, and she still loves me. That's the most important thing. So let me just end by saying I wish all the big problems that we've lived through and that we're going to live through would be as easily solved as the, my fridge problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. We know that it's late, um, but I want to give a chance for just one or two questions. Uh, this evening, there'll be more opportunities tomorrow. Uh, and so I'm going to take a question from over here and a question from over here. Um, so, anyone on this side? A question? Any question. Yes. Yes, sir. Please stand and, and speak loudly for us. Uh, hi, my name is Tobias Jones, I'm a student of CCPS, College of Senior Professional Studies. And what I'd like to ask you basically is, do you feel like Lutheranism in itself was a, 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 a serious mechanism or tool in terms of anti-Semitism, or was that happened without Lutheranism? Okay. Can you repeat this to me? I'm a bit hard of hearing. I have two hearing aids, but they never restore your normal hearing. The, the question, as I understand it, is, was Lutheranism uh, okay. part of the problem with anti-Semitism okay. or part of the solution? Is that, is that fair? Yeah, yeah. okay. Lutheranism. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, we'll let's so yeah, yeah, I can talk to that. Uh, and uh, what I'll tell you is, is not very cheerful. Um, Martin Luther, uh, at one point, wrote a, um, a very Im important essay uh, whose name was, I think, that Jesus Christ was a Jew. Uh, that was when he was, of course, in conflict with the Roman Catholic Church, uh, a very serious conflict. And he tried to get the Jews on his side uh, and against the Roman Catholic hierarchy, uh, from which he was at that point already alienated. He was not successful, OK? in bringing the, the, the Jews to his side. And so roughly 10 years later, another essay came out by Martin Luther, whose title was On the Jews and the Lies. And it is an absolutely horrible anti-Semitic essay. Uh, there are a number of points which he suggests, number of actions which he suggests, one of the first one, if I remember correctly, was that all the Jewish synagogues in Germany be burned. Second point was that all the Torah scrolls be taken away 
and destroyed. And here, seven points. One point, for instance, was is for the Jews to give up all their belongings. And the end of the essay reads verbatim, and so away with them. That is the last sentence. Now, when you look at uh, Hitler's program, uh, based, of course, uh, on anti-Semitism, which already existed in Germany at the time, uh, which he used to these nefarious ends, of course, of actually murdering the Jews, you will see that much of the program of Martin Luther's is pretty much based on Martin Luther's second essay. And that is, of course, a very, very serious thing. So Lutheranism, I'm afraid, was not much of a help uh, as far as Christian-Jewish relations are concerned. Uh, if anything, it made it worse uh, at, at that particular time. Now, since then, with me being a Jew and a theologian, I have tried very hard to collect documents, uh, contemporary church documents, uh, that deal with uh, Christian-Jewish relations, and particularly with Christian-Jewish dialogue and education. And it is uh, the Lutheran Church of America, or the American Lutheran Church, I should say, I think that's a pro proper title, which have actually disavowed Martin Luther and what he wrote in that particular essay. Uh, that document says, don't pay any attention to it. That was something very, uh, uh, con something that, that was conditioned by that particular time in which he lived, in his particular situation vis-a-vis -vis the Roman Catholic Church, etc. cetera. They, uh, they want no part of it. And that makes me very happy, needless to say, and should make both Christians and Jews happy. But uh, the answer to your question is Martin Luther was no help whatsoever with regard to anti-Semitism. If anything, he made it worse. Let's do one question from this side. Anything? Yes. For those of us that can't come tomorrow, could you speak based on your experience, just some kind of snippet about what what tomorrow morning is your answer to that question? Well, I, ca I really cannot. I hate to disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask that again? <laughs> um, yeah, they, these are being videotaped, so you okay. will have yeah. access okay. to the right, right. 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 So, uh, Let me just say that I have come to, uh, to a response to the question of where was God in Auschwitz that satisfies me. And uh, I want to pass that on to a wider audience, and that's why I invited you to come tomorrow, which you probably cannot do. I'm sorry about that. Because there may be people here who have the very same question, not with regard to Auschwitz necessarily, but what about these natural disasters that hit us, like uh, the Southeast Asia tsunamis, uh, tsunami or the earthquake in Haiti that killed, I think, 350,000 people. Now, you know, when you read the Bible, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament also, you get away with an idea of a God who is almighty. And I have no idea where the word almighty comes from because the Hebrew word is not, doesn't mean almighty at all. It comes through the Septuagint, the Greek translation, uh, which isn't always correct, let's put it that way. Uh, all benevolent. Now, if you are almighty and all benevolent, then something wrong cannot happen on earth. And if you love your people, am I right? I mean, I think so. Uh, so what I'm trying to say, or what I'll say tomorrow to some extent without giving away everything I want to say, is that I have been able to uh, somehow envision God on the model of my own father who would have gone through high, through hell and high water to save my sister and me from anything bad that could have happened to us. Uh, I will deal with it theologically, which I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I want to believe in a God who really stands with me and uh, whom I can accept, with whom I can live. An idea, God idea that is acceptable to me, you see. 
and the biblical God idea, which is time conditioned, of course. I mean, we have to understand the Bible was written a, a few thousand years ago, okay? Well, when you read the uh, rabbinical literature, which to us, Jews, is authoritative, much of it is authoritative, maybe not all, then you'll see that within Judaism itself, there has been evolu an evolution in terms of how we consider, what we consider God to be or not to be. And I want to share with you some insights from the rabbinical literature to, sh to show you what has happened there in terms of thought evolution, which makes the idea of God palatable and experience, exper experienceable. Is that such a word? It is it's such that. a word? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but you know, the more books you read, people coin their own words now. We, we're not stuck with the Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary. So I can do that too. Uh, so uh, look, look at the CD that you get or the DVD. And uh, let me also say this, that if you have major questions after you come tomorrow and hear me, uh, my friend here, Dr. McMahon, has my email. You can write to me by email, and I will respond. I won't re respond the following day, I tell you that much, because there's too much stuff that comes in. Uh, you have to identify yourself, and I will, w w we can continue the conversation. I'm willing to do that. Thank you. Okay? I'm sorry I can't totally I acquiesce to your <laughs> request. Would you all join me in expressing your appreciation to Dr. McMahon? <laughs>